Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Buddhist Path of Awakening course. As we work our way through the words of my perfect teacher, by Patro Rinpoche. And tonight we are in part two, chapter two. We're going to do part of this chapter, I think. Uh, this is very long material and uh, continue next week too. So Michael is leading off. Take it away, sir. Will do. So as John said, this is a fairly long chapter. It has a lot of material related to uh, the great vehicle, the Mahayana. And uh, tonight we'll be talking about just the first section, the four immeasurables, or uh, as it's called in this text, the four boundless qualities. Sometimes they're called the four limitless ones. Um, but limitless both in their scope and also the profundity of the impact on us as practitioners. So you can think of it as limitless or boundless or immeasurable and both of them, really. Um, We've actually studied this material some before. There was material uh, on the four limitless ones, the four immeasurables in the um, the Trumper Rinpoche summary, seminary summary um, on the Mahayana, the Bodhisattva Path of Wisdom and Compassion. And I'll actually be talking a little bit about that. And also there was a chapter on the four immeasurables in the uh, text that we read, if you were with us at the time, uh, Trollic Rinpoche's book, Mind at Ease. And actually, I wanted to start with that because this opening paragraph really, um, I think, makes pretty clear the power of practicing uh, the four immeasurables, the four boundless ones, the four limitless ones. And what he says to uh, quote that text, I have to juggle a few pieces here, sorry. He starts off by saying, the four immeasurables are a practice that allows us to enter into a dialogue of compassion and wisdom with the world instead of seeing the world as a reality to be rejected, resisted, defined, defied, and escaped from. So that's just the first sentence. And just to unpack that a little bit, that's what the four immeasurables are about, is changing our relationship to ourselves changing our relationship to the world around us. So that, as he says, uh, we can enter into a dialogue of compassion and wisdom with the world instead of, or rather than seeing the world as a reality to be rejected, resisted, defied, and escaped from. Could also add to that a world that we want to, or feel we need to manipulate, control, or stage manage in some way. So by working with the four immeasurables, we're entering into a different kind of relationship with the world and with ourselves as well. He goes on to say, these meditations are designed to bring about the type of feelings, emotions, and thoughts that will have a positive effect on our character. So they're meant to be transformative. They're meant to, again, make some change in our outlook, in our feelings, our emotions, and our behaviors. He says, many of our actions are unhelpful and self-destructive because they stem directly from our unexamined egocentric attitudes. So that um, I, I think that's it's fairly self-explanatory that when we act on the basis of the very limited viewpoint of ego, we get caught up in all kinds of struggles, all kinds of dramas of passion, aggression, and ignorance. And this leads to uh, pain and struggle for us and for others. Um, and says so these actions are unhelpful and self-destructive. Meditating on the four immeasurables provides the opportunity to reorient ourselves and transcend our limited self-absorbed states of being. It also counteracts our unconscious tendency to rationalize our selfish acts, selfish acts because often even our altruistic actions are shot through with selfishness. So meditation on the four immeasurables has a lot to do with letting go of ego. It's a lot to do with letting go of a self-cherishing um, way of being. Um, it's said that the development of compassion, which is what we do through the four immeasurables, uh, is 
that compassion is innate, that we have the seeds of compassion in us, that in fact it's a natural part of our makeup. Uh, traditionally, the teachings will talk about how even the most vicious animals show love, care, and concern for their young. Um, and that compassion, at least in some limited form, is present in all beings. Um, so you could think of this seed of compassion as literally like a seed, and that under the right conditions, given the right, the right causes and conditions, like a seed, the compassion will grow and flourish. And that that's really the point of, one of the points of engaging in the practice of the four limitless ones, the four boundless ones, is to develop our inherent compassion. Um, in Trungpa Rinpoche's presentation on the four immeasurables, it begins really with love for oneself. Uh, that, and there are two ways in which we can understand this. One is, and, and, and how love for oneself then leads to compassion for other beings. It's, it's a two-step process. Obviously, many people, many beings get stuck just on their love for themselves and never grow beyond that. But the point of this practice and the point of contemplating the four immeasurables is to realize the possibility that, in fact, uh, compassion can be cultivated, that it can be developed, that it can flourish. And that's really, uh, again, that's part of the change of attitude that Trollog Rinpoche was talking about in you know, the introduction to his chapter. So one way of understanding what this means, how um, love for oneself can lead to compassion for all beings, um, in a very simple way uh, is uh, practiced in meditation. Um, the, one of the things about meditation practice altogether is it, there's a real simplicity that meditation practice that can belie the profundity of the practice. So in a very simple way, when we practice sitting meditation, what we're asked to do, uh, what we're instructed, what the um, oral traditions say, is that we allow ourselves to simply be that when we're practicing meditation, there are no good thoughts that we need to grasp onto, there are no bad thoughts to push away, that we just meet our experience just as it is. We meet ourselves just as we are. And that whatever we experience, um, there's no freak out, that we simply allow ourselves to be in meditation practice. This, in fact, is more difficult than it seems. It should be easy because basically what we're asked to do is um, just sit with no effort, no expectation, and not interfere in any way. To, in a sense, just be and not do anything. Uh, in fact, we're habituated to doing anything but. However, to the extent that we are able to just simply allow ourselves to be and to just meet our experience, be as we are, um, that is compassion toward ourselves. It's acceptance of ourselves just as we are in the moment. It may not last very long, but it's a practice of exactly that, just meeting ourselves, just being on our experience, just as we are, with nothing further to do, and nothing to hold on to, and nothing to push away. And the more that we're actually able to do that in meditation practice, just be in our experience just as it is, without trying to change, control, or judge, or evaluate, or do any, any kind of, of our ordinary mental activity, the more we're able to do that with ourselves, the more we're able to do that with other beings as well. Uh, and that if we're not able to do that with ourselves, well, in fact, we'll find it extremely difficult to um, do that with other beings. That, uh, in fact, those mental habits will continue in terms of how we relate to other people as well. And so, so then we're back into exactly what Trala Rinpoche said. Instead of see, entering into a dialogue with the world with the wisdom and compassion, we're engaging with the world from the point of view of something to be rejected or judged or controlled or managed in some way. So, in fact, the very simplicity of meditation practice, as I said, really belies the profundity of what we're practicing. It's um, not something that we so much consciously set out to do as much as when we're able to simply relax and practice. That's what happens. We're able to just be with ourselves just as we are. And from that seed, we can be, allow other beings, other people, whatever we experience to be just as it is as well. So that's one way in which you could think of um, how 
caring for ourselves, love for ourselves, um, can then develop into compassion. The other way in which it's talked about um, that how caring, love for ourselves translates into compassion for other beings is that uh, in a very simple way, what we come to realize, uh, whether we meditate or not, is that generally speaking, most of the time, uh, we wish for ourselves to be happy and we wish for ourselves to uh, be free of suffering, to avoid suffering. And the contemplation that we're asked to do by our teachers is to realize that this in fact is true of all beings, that all beings wish to be happy and that all beings wish to be free of suffering. So by looking at our experience and then growing from there, opening from there, we realize that in fact, this is the condition of all beings. And that um, when we read another text, the Shanti Deva text, there was an appendix we read about meditation on the equality of beings. And this is, this is that great equality, that all beings want to be happy. All beings want to avoid suffering and be free of suffering. And that with this, again, as contemplating this allows us to expand our borders or begin to let go a little bit and just open uh, to this reality that in this way, we're all alike. So um, these are just, uh, again, Trungpa Rinpoche really presented the four immeasurables beginning with love for oneself. Um, in this text, though, we're actually going to begin in a different way. Uh, we're going to begin with the contemplation and the discussion of impartiality or equanimity. Um, and there are different ways, uh, there are several different ways actually to practice the contemplation and meditation on the four immeasurables. Um, and if you're curious, you could go back and look at Trollag Rinpoche's book because this presentation is somewhat different than uh, what we're going to be talking about with uh, Pakhtrol Rinpoche's presentation here tonight. Um, and the one that's best is the one that works for you. Uh, there is, other than that, there is no better or worse. It's simply which one strikes you, which one strikes me, which one strikes each one of us as most helpful in developing compassion, letting go of um, hatred and aggression. Um, I'll also say that each one of the four immeasurables, this is again from a different teaching, uh, has, traditionally it's taught that each one has both a near enemy and a far enemy. Um, the near enemy is something that looks like the particular immeasurable, the particular boundless one. The far enemy is pretty clearly its opposite. Um, so we're going to begin talking about equanimity, but I just wanted to say something about the near and far enemies because uh, it, it's easy to go astray in regard to impartiality or equanimity. The near enemy is indifference, not caring at all. And that's not the point of equanimity or impartiality. The point is to um, level out, or Trungpa Rinpoche actually uses the words equalize, to equalize our caring for beings. That ordinarily for most of us, there are people that we're obviously more attached to, and then there are people we actively dislike or see as enemies. And the point of meditation on equanimity or impartiality is to even that out somewhat. Um, it doesn't mean we have to dislike the people we like, but it means we try to let go of something of our aggression and prejudice to the people we don't like. The far enemy is pretty obviously any kind of prejudice, any kind of um, prejudgment and bias for or against, because either way, it leads to struggle, it leads to conflict, it leads to um, stress and drama of all kinds. So with impartiality, um, as I say, uh, Patrol Rinpoche begins with this one. He says we should start by developing impartiality because otherwise, if we don't, whatever love, compassion, and joy we generate will tend to be one-sided and not completely pure. Um, so we begin with the meditation on impartiality. And essentially, the meditation on impartiality is in some ways a meditation on impermanence or changeability. It's uh, the, uh, in the Patrol Rinpoche text, he talks a lot about the uh, fact that in 
from beginningless time, all beings have been our parents. So that at some point, even the person we most see as our most uh, most significant enemy, at some time or another took care of us and nurtured us. Um, separate from that, uh, the whole idea here is to realize how changeable relationships are and that even the people closest to us, we have moments of irritation, we have moments of wanting space, wanting distance, um, that in fact, uh, and the point of this is to begin letting go of fixed mind, letting go of a fixed attitude, fixed judgment, um, and just be open to all beings. It's a meditation, you could say, on impermanence. Um, as he says, um, impartiality in Tibetan means giving up our hatred for enemies and our infa infatuation with friends and realize that these are all based on causes and conditions and therefore they're changeable. Um, and instead, having an even-minded attitude toward all beings, free of attachment to those we care about, um, and hatred or aggression towards those who we dislike. So basically, that's it. That's, that's the essence of meditation on impartiality or equanimity. Um, he says when we do feel um, particularly attached or particularly aggressive towards someone, it's it comes from a lack of investigation. So really the contemplation here is one of investigation and really looking at the nature of relationships. And again, it doesn't mean that we have to feel one way or another. It means that we can give up some of the rigidity or uh, fixatedness of, you know, or opinionatedness about uh, people around us and people in the world. And again, a lot of the stories that he presents in the text involve uh, birth, rebirth, through, you know, over lifetimes. And so um, the particular poem is particularly graphic in terms of bringing this up. He eats his father's flesh. He, 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 he beats his mother off. He dandles on his lap his own unfortunate enemy. The wife is gnawing on her husband's bones. I laugh to see what happens in Samsara show. Very graphic. But the idea is if with lifetimes and lifetimes, rebirth, births upon births, through beginningless time, that all beings at some point or another have been our parents, all beings at some point or another have been our enemies. And he gives some other different examples of this as well. But again, I think the main point is um, to let go of fixed attitudes, fixed beliefs about uh, people around us and the world around us. He says, there is not one who has not been our father or mother in the course of previous lives. Um, And he talks about even that even in this life, we can think that people dislike us or our opponents, but really are we're mistaken in our view uh, that there are people who could easily become our friends, even now, even though now they seem to be uh, an opponent or an enemy of some kind. He talks about how uh, even those who are closest to us can turn against us. He says, um, sons and daughters who've cheated or murdered their own parents. And we know this is true. So uh, again, it's just pointing to the changeability, the impermanence um, at the heart of relationship and letting, again, letting go of a fixed view, letting go of any one uh, mind. He says, there's no guarantee that those we consider adversaries today will not be our children in future lives, or that our present friends won't be reborn as enemies, and so on. It's only because we take these fleeting perceptions of friend and enemy as real that we accumulate negative actions through attachment and hatred. So it's, again, having some sense of the changeability in relationship that we're really asked to do in the contemplating impartiality. Um, the actual meditation that he suggests, unlike uh, most meditations on the four immeasurables, the general idea is we begin by thinking about or visualizing uh, somebody that we have a positive relationship with, and then we, uh, having developed some feeling from that, think about somebody who we have a, a more casual or neutral relationship with, and then after that, um, meditate on or contemplate somebody who we have a difficult relationship with or a problematic relationship with someone we'd consider an enemy um, and then finally the with 
at the end, we try to imagine a love or compassion toward all beings. And the reason that it's done in that order is that it's easiest to begin with someone that we care about, move to someone neutral, uh, then to someone that we have some kind of enmity toward, and then finally imagine extending that feeling toward all beings. But with impartiality, it's a little different. And basically, the recommendation, the, the practice that Pakul Rinpoche describes is to actually begin with someone we don't like at all. So we can actually do this for a few minutes right now. Um, I think the first thing is just, as always with any contemplative practice, it begins with just simple sitting meditation. So we could take a good seat, a good posture, allow ourselves to slow down, just feel how we're feeling for a moment. And then actually practice shamatha, just work with the breath. Just feel the breath, natural breathing. And just allow our minds to relax. And once the mind's just a little bit settled, think about someone who you have an antagonistic relationship with. It could be someone in your life. It could be someone in the world. It doesn't have to be someone you know personally, but someone who you have some kind of negative feeling toward, antagonistic, you see as an enemy, someone you don't like at all. You can be bold and actually think of someone who you have very strong anger or hatred toward. And the idea is we want to train our mind by various means, he says, so that the anger and hatred that we feel uh, no longer arises. <laughs> Perhaps imagine them as someone you have a more neutral feeling toward, or someone who, if they have a quality that you find particularly irritating, realize that it causes pain for them as well. And imagine that perhaps they're able to let go of or recognize something, a possibility in themselves that allows them to be better feel better, do better. But at least a neutral feeling. And then consider the possibility, as the teachings say, that all beings at some time have been our mother or father, have taken care of us, sheltered us. So we feel some love or some sort of positive feeling, if possible, toward this person who we ordinarily have an antagonistic relationship to. Realize that whatever irritation they may cause for us, that they're hurting too. We wish for them to be free of that pain. And then, as with any contemplation of each of the four immeasurables. Imagine that this, whatever positive feeling we've generated towards this being, that this could be the experience of all beings, that all beings be free of negativity, suffering, pain.
and then return to shamatha practice. Just let go altogether. Just feel the breath. Particularly the out breath. Just relax the mind. So it's just a brief contemplation of impartiality or equanimity. And the idea is, again, is to even out our compassion. One metaphor I heard for this, it would be as if you were a farmer trying to irrigate fields and uh, a level field is what would be much more easy to irrigate than a field with lots of hills and valleys where water would collect in some places and not others. And in the same way, uh, as Trungpa Rinpoche said, with equanimity or impartiality or equalizing, you could think of it as kind of a leveling. Now, it does say in the final paragraph, Apocryphal Rinpoche says, now it is no substitute for boundless impartiality just to think of everybody, friends and enemies as the same without any particular feeling of compassion, hatred or whatever. He said, this is mindless impartiality and brings neither harm nor benefit. The image given for truly boundless impartiality is a banquet given by a great sage. You could think of a banquet or a feast given by a great sage. When the great sages of old offered feasts, they would invite everyone, high or low, powerful or weak, good or bad, exceptional or ordinary, without making any distinctions whatsoever. Likewise, our attitude toward all beings throughout space should be a vast feeling of compassion, encompassing them all equally. Train your mind until you reach such a sense of boundless impartiality. So you can also say that ultimately it's impartiality that each one of the immeasurables in its own way uh, is, uh, you could say, is an antidote of sorts to ego. But impartiality in particular really, uh, I think, gets, really gets at the heart of it. The next one is the meditation on love. Um, and the idea of love here, uh, as I say, Trumper Rinpoche talks about this first as love or loving, a loving attitude toward oneself. Um, and talks about different ways in which this might arise. One of which is having some recognition and beginning to have some confidence in our Buddha nature. That we begin to um, have some appreciation of our wakefulness, our awake qualities. And we begin to realize that there's a potentiality in us um, that perhaps we hadn't recognized before, just to wake up, to be present for people. Uh, and to actually have some choice about how we're going to be in the world rather than just acting on habit. Um, when we talk about love in regard to all beings, uh, we're basically talking about the wish for all beings to be happy. And we could, you know, it starts with ourselves, but we extend it outward from there. Um, and I think I remember once hearing a presentation on this. If we think about someone who we really do love, it could be our parents, it could be our children, it could be a partner or a lover, that when we really have that feeling, we want the best for them. We want them to be happy. Um, and that's really the feeling that we're trying to extend to all beings. Uh, we, so again, as with you know, all aspects of developing, developing compassion. The idea is we have the seed in us. We have these experiences. We just want to have it flourish, grow, become boundless. Uh, that's limitless, immeasurable. So that it's not just in regard to a few, but that we're able to extend some of that feeling, some of that energy, some of that warmth to all sentient beings, some of that kindness to all sentient beings. So. That's the idea of uh, this particular immeasurable, the immeasurable of love, that we wish for the happiness, we're wishing for the happiness of others. Um, with this, we let go of our preoccupation with, uh, as that Beatles song goes, I, me, mine. Um, I'd sing it for you, but I'm not as good a singer as George Harrison. But the two of we're beginning to let go of you know, self-cherishing 
And rather than I, me, mine, we begin to expand a sense of caring to all beings, um, wishing that all beings should be, should be happy. Um, as, Shanti, as, as Shanti Deva said in the Bodhicharya Avatara that we read, all the suffering there is in this world comes from wishing ourselves to be happy. All the happiness there is in the world comes from wishing others to be happy. Um, here again, there's a near, a near enemy and a far enemy. And the near enemy, interestingly, is a conditional love or um, love with attachment possessiveness, which there is some interest in the other person, but it's basically self-referential. Um, and so, uh, and it's often mistaken for love, but we're really can become, uh, especially when, possess when possessiveness reaches its real extremes, it become really dangerous and aggressive. Um, but it, the idea here is that it's simply that wish to make other, to, to others to be happy without reference to oneself, without reference to ego, without reference, or at least with less reference to one's needs and perspectives. Um, so basically, uh, Patro Rinpoche says, through meditating on impartiality, we come to regard all beings with the same great love, the love that we feel for all of them should be like that of parents taking care of their young children. And here he's talking about the great patience that parents show their children, the care, the concern, the attentiveness, um, the uh, devotion to other that's involved here. Um, that in fact, we could express the same kind of devotion, kindness and care to all beings. Um, and he, he goes on to say, and this is, again, classical, this is the classical view in the Mahayana, that all beings are striving for happiness and comfort. They all want to be happy and comfortable. Not one of them wants to be unhappy or to suffer. And yet, yet, and this is the part that, you know, as, as we begin to wake up ourselves and begin to see our Buddha nature, as Trungpa Rinpoche said, yet they do not understand that the cause of happiness is positive actions and instead give themselves over to negative actions. Their deepest wishes and their actions are therefore at odds in their attempts to find happiness. They only bring suffering to themselves. And this is a point of view that's expressed over and over again in the Mahayana. The beings are confused about what brings happiness, confused about what brings suffering. And for this reason, even though their intention and their desire is to be happy, uh, and to be free of suffering, their actions, in fact, bring about the opposite. And that for that reason, uh, you know, bodhisattvas in particular have great compassion for sentient beings. Um, and here again, he's talking, in terms of this, the contemplation on love, um, over and over again, meditate on the thought of how wonderful it would be if each one of the being, each one of these beings, suffering beings, could have all the happiness and comfort they wish. And he says we should meditate on it until we want others to be happy just as intensely as you want yourself to be happy. Um, And he talks about actions of body, speech and mind and how to express kindness and care. In, in terms of body, speech, and mind, whatever we do with our body should be gentle and pleasant, endeavoring not to harm, but rather to help others. That speech should express our attitude, should not express attitudes such as contempt or criticism or jealousy. That we should make as, our every word pre, uh, pleasant and true. Um, and then our mental attitude, we should wish to help others. Um, without wishing for anything in return. That just the joy and the happiness of other beings is enough for us. Uh, and that we should pray throughout all our lives that we never harm so much as a hair of another being's head and always help each one of them. Um, and he talks about the importance in particular of not making anyone under um, in, in important anyone in who over whom we have authority not making them suffer because again this really gets into the uh, negative karma of harmful intention um, so we shouldn't 
beat them, force them to work too hard. This is animals as well as people. Um, and we'd always, under, our, under all circumstances, be kind in thought, word, and deed. He talks about also being kind and loving toward parents and older people, uh, showing some appreciation for the love and care that they've shown us. And he talks about the example of the Buddha even going into heaven to teach his mother, who died a few days after childbirth. Um, again, just as a mark of the kind of respect and care and loving that you know, the Buddha showed to all beings. Um, so basically, the essence of loving kindness of, you know, is, is exactly that. Kindness, gentleness, care and concern for others. Uh, describes, he even describes a story of the two people who go to see the king of Tibet and see all these people who, um, you know, are in prison or facing possible execution. It's an interesting story, and um, I'm not entirely sure. I think the point of it is that sometimes kindness can be, can be hard. But sometimes the kindest thing, because this was the king who also established Buddhism in Tibet, and in that way benefited countless beings, including us today, because if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here today. Um, as he says, the king says, Tibet is a wild land, hard to subjugate. For that reason, I've had to produce the illusion of persecution of prisoners being executed, dismembered, and so on. But in reality, I have not, not harmed a single hair on anyone's head. That takes, that's a level of skillfulness that's far beyond anything I'm capable of doing. But I think the, the, the point is that really taking into account the welfare of others, that that's, that's the happiness of others, that that's the entire point. And so um, the image given at the end of this chapter is of a mother bird taking care of her chicks. She starts by making a soft, comfortable nest. She shelters them with her wings, keeping them warm. She's always gentle with them and she just and she uh, protects them until they can fly away. And then again, lets them go. Like that mother bird, learn to be kind in thought, word and deed to all beings in the three worlds. So that's what we're that's what we're uh, enjoined to do. First practice impartiality or equanimity, and then extend love to all beings, wishing that may all beings be happy. Um, we recite this every morning and every evening as part of the chants before we begin our uh, meditation practice. And um, we could really take it to heart, even for just a moment. And as Trala Grimpache says, it's transformative, it's purifying. It, uh, in, uh, from a karma point of view, plant seeds for positive actions. And um, you can think of the four immeasurables as both a formal contemplative meditation practice, as well as a post-meditation practice, perhaps most importantly, as a post-meditation practice. It should have some impact on how we live our lives outside of meditation. It's something we should bring from meditation out into the world. So with that, I'll turn it over to John for uh, more immeasurability. Thank you, Michael. So <clears throat> in talking about these four immeasurables, uh, they're also in another context called the, the four abodes of Brahma. Brahma is one of the trinity of Hindu gods. So they're called the Brahma Viharas the abodes of Brahma. And um, they are part of what are called the three supreme methods that we're enjoined to practice every day, and we do. Um, the first method is this, the four measurables, uh, arousing these qualities in ourselves and towards the world. The second of the supreme methods is to develop the mind of meditation or the mind of reality, you might say, the mind that can dwell in reality as it is, the dharmakaya, the truth, emptiness, shunyata, whatever you want to call it. It's the mind that is simply sees without even trying to see what is here now accurately without preconception 
and without judgment. And the third immeasurable um, is to dedicate your practice to the benefit of all sentient beings, which we do every day. We dedicate the merit. These are called the three supreme methods. And you can see the two of them really have to do with developing love and compassion um, in yourself for others, a, a generosity and a kindness. And the second uh, of them is this idea of resting in reality and that the, all these three go together. That when one rests in the real world, there is nothing left to do except to behave, to relate to the world through the four measurables and be constantly giving away the merit uh, generated to all sentient beings. So this is really a very, we're, we're being led into a very transformative process here where we are going to change. Because as we come into it, our orientation is me, I. How do I get something out of this? And how do I improve myself and do a better job? And really what we're being enjoined to do and directed to do and led to do is to give up that tremendous emphasis on I and instead begin to appreciate this world full of other and to be to dedicate ourselves to its benefit. So the third meditation that we're discussing here is the meditation on compassion. And this gets very traditional, um, where to imagine that beings are tormented by cruel suffering and would to wish to free them from it. It's all around us, isn't it? There is suffering everywhere. I mean, <laughs> I'm in Boulder, Colorado one of the sort of paradigms of um, heaven on, in, in, on earth. You know, it's kind of the, uh, the very pure place. There are people on the streets who are suffering enormously, homeless people, people who, whose minds are not uh, where they should be, as well as other sentient beings, animals of all kinds that are around and suffering. And we're being enjoined to have compassion for them to live for them. This is a new way to be, or it's a more thoroughly compassionate way to be. It's a transformative a process that we're being asked to engage in. It's very profound and not easy. So he says, the meditation on compassion is to imagine beings tormented by cruel, cruel suffering and to wish to free them from it. Train your mind by taking the suffering of that condemned prisoner on yourself or anyone. You, you know, those of us who live in uh, Manhattan, you can see people on the streets all the time who are suffering, who are crazy, who are, have lost their minds in, to one degree or another. It's very, it's much more prevalent there. But even in Boulder, Colorado, it's here too says, <clears throat> likewise, sheep being led to the slaughter, perhaps one was your mother. Reflect that although this suffering creature is not actually your father or mother in this present life, it is sure to have been your parent at some time in your past lives and to brought you up with great kindness. So whether or not you believe that, you know, and can get behind that, one can have enormous compassion, feeling for other sentient beings like a sheep like uh, that's about to be led to the slaughter or a cow. I remember um, years ago learning that um, almost all chickens in the United States and elsewhere are raised in hen houses. Chickens are very social animals, uh, hence the term pecking order. You know, they organize themselves into social orders. And yet, when they're raised for meat, they are put into hen houses with, where suddenly they are cheek by jowl with other chickens, maybe 10,000. And the light is controlled uh, to simulate day and night. 
and they have their bills cut off so that they can't peck each other because they go crazy. And eventually, of course, they're slaughtered for meat and they become the chicken that we eat. So I think, you know, Trooper Rinpoche, he didn't want us to go on any trips, as he put it. But this was back in the day when Eastern religion was just entering this country and offering new paradigms of how to behave. And young people, hippies, were adopting um, different kinds of uh, uh, ethos, one of which was to be vegetarian. And he encouraged people not to be vegetarian because he felt that it was too much of a sort of a, a mental distortion. Um, it was trying to become something holy or good or um, virtuous or spiritual. I think um, it might be a little bit different today because things have changed and we've all gotten used to this. And Patro Rinpoche, of course, is enjoining us all to become vegetarian and to stop eating meat. And he inveighs against uh, monks and lamas who uh, eat meat. But um, really, it's a matter for each one of us. The whole point is to develop sympathetic compassion for all sentient beings. We can eat these chickens that we buy at King Supers or A&P or whatever, because we don't see how they're raised and slaughtered. If we did, it might be much more difficult. So it's up to each one of us to, we might say, to raise our consciousness, to increase our intelligence and make our decisions. He says, um, all those beings who now indulge in harmful actions will inevitably have to suffer too. With this in mind, meditate with compassion on all beings who are creating causes of suffering for themselves by killing and other harmful actions. Then consider the suffering of all beings born in the hells among the pretas who are in, in, as consumed with envy and other realms of torment. Identify with them as if they were your parents or yourself and meditate on compassion with great energy. So we're being asked to really wake up from our habitual patterns that we've lived all our lives of being, of just going sort of mindlessly going through our lives and instead begin to see, sympathize with, feel other sentient beings. He says, wherever there are beings, there are negative actions and the resulting suffering. There are the 10 negative actions, which include things like um, killing, stealing, lying, um, improper sexual relations, um, and all kinds of things like this. It says, uh, and we're being asked to give this up and to become much more sane, awake, less ruled by our habits. He says, when you start meditating on compassion, it is important to focus first on suffering beings individually, one at a time, and only then to train yourself step by step until you can meditate on all beings as a whole. And so we could train ourselves by taking the often difficult step of exposing ourselves, of opening ourselves, of establishing communication between ourselves and a suffering sentient being. It might be a human being, it might be an animal, but on the whole, we rarely do that. He says, um, this, because he's, this is Patro Rinpoche and he's living in, in uh, 19th century Tibet, he's very focused on the animal world, which is all around him. Um, that's the way people lived then. Uh, today, we don't see this world very little. He says, um, I guess what we're really being asked to do in one way or another is to feel the suffering of beings around us, be they human or animal, 
and to have sympathy for that and to act in consonance with that sympathy. He talks about spirits, malignant spirits, which we don't really know too much about. <laughs> uh, harmful spirits. Um, and uh, how you should have compassion for them. These malignant spirits are far more in need of compassion than any benefactors. They have become harmful spirits because of their evil karma. Reborn as pretas, those are hungry ghosts who are consumed by envy. With horrible bodies, their pain and fear is unimaginable. But we know people who are consumed by fear and envy and jealousy. Jealousy is perhaps one of the most potent and dangerous and harmful of all the emotions. He says, he talks about Milarepa and the demon who came, who came into his cave and found all these demons there. He says, they taught him the truth of Marpa's teaching that everything in the universe is mind and that the nature of mind is empty and radiant. And so the ogress of the rock sang to him, this demon of your own tendencies arises from your mind. This is where fear, hatred, greed, insensitivity lie. If you don't recognize the nature of your mind, I'm not going to leave just because you tell me to go. If you don't realize that your mind is void, there are many more demons beside myself. That means that if you don't really come into the world of reality, this world of emptiness, clarity, presence, full of compassion, then you're going to live in a world of demons all around you, everywhere. But if you recognize the nature of your own mind, adverse circumstances will only serve to sustain you because they'll wake you up even I, the ogress of the rock, will be at your bidding. So, Patra Rinpoche says, in Buddhism, once we have taken refuge in the Dharma, we have to give up harming others. Now, there are certain kinds of harm that are, are tradi traditional. We're, we've been born into it, like going to the supermarket and buying meat. Although that's not a direct form of harm. And Trungpa Rinpoche made that point too. You're not actually killing an animal. Um, and there is a difference, obviously. And yet, we are participating um, in that world. And we have to consider that. It says, um, Just as no pleasures can bring, bring delight to someone whose body is ablaze with fire, nor can great compassionate ones be pleased when harm is done to sentient beings. And he goes on and on about um, the different forms of uh, cruelty to animals, practicers of red rituals, which means killing animals as part of a ritual. And he inveighs against this. Um, he says of uh, these kinds of people, they're always on the lookout for prey, like killer rakshasas marching to war. Rakshasas are evil, um, non-human beings who are warriors, enemies. Their faces in flames, shaking with rage, bristling with aggression. As soon as they die, they are catapulted straight into hell. Um, this is clear. We're being asked to really change our minds in one degree or another to develop compassion for all sentient beings and which is very different from the way we normally live our lives. He says, during the reign of the Dharma king, Trisung Detson, whom Michael referred to earlier, the Bonpos, they were the native religion of Tibet, made offerings of blood and meat for the king's benefit. The second Buddha, Buddha from Odiana, that's Padmasambhava, the great Pandit Vimalamitra, the great Bodhisattva Abbot, that's Shantarakshita, and other translators and Panditas 
were all completely outraged by the sight of the Bonbo's offerings. Then he says, always take the lowest place, wear simple clothes, help other beings as much as you can. In everything you do, simply work at developing love and compassion until they have become a fundamental part of you. That will serve the purpose, even if you do not practice the more outward and conspicuous forms of Dharma, such as prayers, virtuous activities, and altruistic works. So we're really being asked to transform ourselves very powerfully and fundamentally with compassion and in other ways. The sutra that perfectly encapsulates the Dharma says, let those who desire Buddhahood not train in many Dharmas, but only one. Which one? Great compassion. And compassion here is not a feeling sorry for. It's a love. It's a resonance with. It's a communication with. Those with great compassion possess all the Buddha's teachings as if it were in the palm of their hand. Nothing could be more effective than love and compassion for purifying us of negative actions and obscurations. And then he, Patro Rinpoche, goes into stories of practitioners who practice these intensely. And I'm not going to go into too, much, too many of them. Um, the stories of the Brahmin nun, Prakash Shashila, who produced the sons. Now this is a very, um, you gotta remember this is at a time when women uh, held a secondary place in society, unlike today, I think, to a large degree. And so the best thing that she could do was to produce virtuous sons. And the sons that she produced were humdingers, um, Asanga and Vasubandhu. And Asanga became uh, one of the primary Mahayanists. His brother Vasubandhu became a very powerful and prominent Terahinianist. He wrote a thing called the Abhidharma Kosha which laid out the Abhidharma teachings and then was converted by his own brother, Asanga, into becoming a Mahayanist. And there's this classic story of um, how Asanga, before he converted his brother Vasubandhu, um, had been trying for years to have a vision of the uh, Buddha Maitreya, the Buddha of the future. Unsuccessfully, he couldn't. And uh, one day, he is walking down the road and he comes across a dog who's half dead, whose body is riddled with maggots lying across the road. And um, he is overwhelmed with compassion, Asanga is. And so what he does is um, he wants to help the dog by ridding it of these maggots. But he realizes, he, he bends down and he's going to lick them off, try to lick them off with his tongue. And then he realizes that's not going to work because the maggots are attracted to the flesh of the dog. So he cuts off a piece of his own flesh and offers it to the maggots. And the, this is a, who knows, a story. <laughs> you think it's real? And then the dog just rises into the air and becomes Maitreya. And Asanga says to him, how is it that I never saw you before? And Maitreya says, you didn't open your heart to me. Um, now you have, and now you can see me. And then he took Asanga to the Tishita heaven and gave him the five teachings of Maitreya and other instructions. And when he came back to the realm of men, Asanga spread the, spread the doctrine of the Mahayana widely. And basically he and his brother founded the Yogacara school, the mind only school of Mahayana Buddhism. He says, since there is no practice like compassion to pure us of all our harmful past actions, and since it is compassion that never fails to make us develop the extraordinary bodhicitta, awakened mind that is, we should persevere in meditating on compassion. It's key. It will awaken us to reality. It will awaken our bodhicitta. And then we get the image of the mother with no arms, whose child is being swept away by a river. He says, how unbearable the anguish of such a mother would be. 
Her love for her child is so intense, but as she cannot use her arms, she cannot catch hold of the child. What can I do now? What can I do? She asks herself. Her only thought is to find some means of saving her child. Her heart breaking, she runs along weeping. In exactly the same way, all beings of the three worlds are being carried away by the river of suffering to drown in the ocean of samsara. It's all around us. So we should meditate on this thinking, what can I do now? And call on your teacher and the three jewels from the very, de from the very depths of your heart. Finally, the fourth meditation is on sympathetic joy. Um, and what this means is that we wish the best for others. Uh, wish that all could live at a high level, rich, healthy, admired, free of all danger, and so forth. And we begin by thinking about a person who easily arouses positive feelings, like a relative, a close friend, someone you love, who is successful, contented, at peace, because it's easiest to have these positive wishes for that kind of a person. And when you establish that feeling of happiness, then try to cultivate the same feeling toward those about whom you feel indifferent, someone neutral. And then do it for all kinds of enemies who have harmed you, especially anyone towards whom you feel jealous. That's key. I mean, can you imagine, isn't this difficult to wish these kinds of things, health, wealth, happiness, for your enemies? Transformative. It requires a transformation of your state of mind. He says, uproot the evil mentality that finds it unbearable that someone else should have such perfect plenty and cultivate a particular feeling of delight for each kind of happiness they might enjoy. So this is a contemplation that you could do. You could first contemplate someone you love or for whom you feel affection, someone then second, someone who, for whom you're indifferent, to whom you're indifferent, and third, someone to whom you have an aversion, hatred, um, and cultivate sympathetic joy for all three of those. What a transformative and difficult thing to do. What an unlikely thing to do. How many of us have ever really done that? He says, the meaning of sympathetic joy is to have a mind free of jealousy. And you need to train to this end. So when you think of your enemy, really what you're doing is overcoming your jealousy of them. Specifically a bodhisattva who has given rise to bodhicitta, awakened mind, for the benefit of all beings, should be trying to establish all those beings in the everlasting happiness of Buddhahood and temporarily in the happiness of the realms of gods and men, human beings. I mean, this is, we're being enjoined to really step into a different way to live life. Once people have been corrupted by jealousy, they no longer see the good in others and their own negative actions increase alarmingly. And then he tells some stories of Milarepa um, and a professor of logic named Tarlo who was jealous of him and who was later reborn as a great demon. And another story, because that's what happens when you're jealous. When you really act on your jealousy and live it to the full, you become a demon to yourself and others. And another was the story of the logician Geshe Tsakpupa, Pua, who tried to poison Milarepa. Same thing. Even the Buddha could not correct such situations of jealousy because a mind tainted with jealousy cannot see anything good in others and so cannot give rise to even the faintest glimmer of faith. And there are the stories of the Buddha's relatives who became his students, supposedly, Devadatta and Sunaksatra, both of whom were jealous of him and never recovered from it. He says, constantly dwelling on such feelings as jealousy and competitiveness. Think about this. 
dwelling on feelings of jealousy and competitiveness. Haven't we all done this? Neither furthers one's own cause nor harms that of one's rivals. It leads to a pointless accumulation of negativity and unhappiness. Give up vile attitudes of this kind. Always sincerely rejoice in the achievements and favorable circumstances of others. What a challenge we're being given. What an extraordinary challenge to rejoice in the achievements and favorable circumstances of others, even when we're jealous of them. He says, think over and over again how truly glad you are that they are such excellent people, so successful and fortunate. Meditate on this from the depth of your heart. And I hope each one of you is thinking of at least one person whom you're really angry with, who you are resentful towards, maybe even jealous of, who knows, and taking this to uh, as a possibility. Then he gives the image of a boundless sympathetic joy um, is that of a mother camel finding her lost calf. Finally, we get to, towards the end of this. He says, the, bound, the four boundless qualities cannot fail to cause us to develop genuine bodhicitta, genuine awakened mind, because they're so anti-ego, so anti-selfishness, and so for generosity and kindness. Therefore, it is vital to cultivate them until they have truly taken root in us. To make things as easy as possible to understand, we can summarize the four boundless qualities in a single phrase, a kind heart. So train yourself. Do you have a kind heart always and in all situations? And all of this really is about intention. Um, it's not about doing the actual actions as much as it's about the intention behind them, the intention of kindness and generosity towards others. And then he gives, he gives this whole chapter is riddled with stories, the story of the mother and daughter drowning in the river um, and each wanting the other to be uh, saved and both being reborn in the celestial realm of Brahma. He says, if you learn to have to always have only kind thoughts, all your wishes for this lifetime will come true. Everything you do will be positive, and at the moment of death you will not suffer. In future lives you will always be reborn in celestial or human realms until finally you attain this level of perfect Buddhahood. So it is always important to check your attitude and cultivate a kind heart. And this is really still a means to the end. What end? The end of awakening, of becoming enlightened, of waking up from the dream of self and other, of selfishness and constant self-aggrandizement. Waking up from that dream into the true world, the world of bodhicitta, of awakened mind. So I'll stop there and we can have a discussion. Is this intimidating? <laughs> and nobody's saying a word. Philip. So in, in one way, I guess it is intimidating, or maybe a few ways. There's certainly a lot of stuff here. And thank you, Michael and John, for this presentation. You've touched on this, but I wanted to come back to it for everyone's sake. In the middle of 215, he sort of brings it all together with this takeaway, right? We can summarize the four boundless qualities in the single phrase, a kind heart. Atisha always placed a unique emphasis on the importance of a kind heart. 
And then he talks about intention, as you mentioned. It is the power of kind or unkind intentions that makes an action positive or negative, strong or weak. Yeah. So Buddhism teaches us anything. It teaches us kindness. Absolutely, yeah. It's also teaching us to recognize our selfishness and to counter it, to really act counter to our own selfishness, which is quite a challenge, I think. The two go together, counter to selfishness and kindness. They're different sides of the same coin, do you think? What a transformation we're being asked to make. It's really profound. Thank you, Philip. It's so difficult to get oneself to act on this. Um, just a small thing. When I was in New York, I used to go to the bank get a bunch of dollar bills so I could hand them out to people begging on the streets a dollar at a time, which is what I felt I could afford, or a couple bucks maybe. And I keep meaning to do it here in Boulder because there's certainly plenty of people on the street here, and I keep forgetting. <laughs> What's that say? Well, you've taught that. I do that now in Connecticut. I have them in my glove box and people stand at the intersections, you know, panhandling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good to keep a bunch of $1 bills in your pocket or whatever you can feel you can afford. Yeah. But except in New York, they talk back to you and say, give me five. Yeah. <laughs> Who said that? Is that and it? and yeah. I said it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. That's true in New York. <laughs> hey, inflation's a real problem. Yeah. Any negative thoughts to being too compassionate? What? I'm sorry? Are there any negative sides for being too compassionate? Like you reward bad behavior, like someone might take that dollar and buy drugs. Maybe. Yeah, that could happen. Val. Yeah, I think the the first part of this chapter that Michael illuminated and Patrol reminds me, it starts with me, kindness to myself. So before I start thinking about out there, what can I do to change out there? I first have to say, what's my intention of my own well-being, my own heart, my own will in all forms? I think that's the most difficult thing for me is first, compassion, kindness. Here. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, a 
Additionally, there's a rub. When you, your intention is to um, have a better attitude and cultivate compassion towards somebody in your life who's causing you an immense amount of stress, doesn't mean necessarily you can reconcile or make peace with them. And so it becomes additionally, it's harder. I'm in a situation right now with a family member where working very hard to cultivate compassion and a healthier perspective, but that doesn't mean that that individual is necessarily uh, going to respond or react to it. And so, you know, the unconditionality, this comes with almost the, the you have to expect nothing in return, which is, which is where I get um, stuck. Uh, How? Well, you know, you, you, it, it, and it's a little bit of um, expecting that if you cultivate compassion and a, and a healthier attitude towards somebody who's being aggressive towards you, you would, you know, the expectation is that it will um, hopefully stop the aggression or solve uh, the, the conflict, right? But it doesn't. And I think that's a very, it's kind of like the golden rule, the, the big secret about the golden rule is that it doesn't require a reciprocity. And I think there's an element of that in this too. Is you, I don't think you can expect, I, th I think part of, for me at least, is certainly not to expect anything in return. I don't know. I don't know if that's, resonates with anybody else, but dropping the, the, the expectation uh, feels imperative. Atisha's last slogan in Lojong was, don't expect applause. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I think it's important, though, to keep in mind that we, what we can expect is to feel better about, to feel good about doing it. And there's nothing contradictory victory you know with that with even with altruism right yeah. being generous whether it's towards a or being compassionate whether it's towards a somebody conflictual you know who's close to you or just giving a, somebody the lane on your highway you know makes you feel good right so we we don't have you know we don't I think it's important to keep in mind that we're not being compassionate or generous, you know, you know, for just just to benefit them. But it's okay to feel good about it too. And it's a, you know, there's this kind of mis. Re let me start this out by first saying my 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 first reaction to the to the readings what Michael was saying about uh, you know a kind heart and then when John was continuing with it my uh, to, and to have compassionate yeah to no to know that the person that you find annoying or irritating is in a lot of pain you know most likely or whatever amount of pain right my first reaction was to feel guilty for recent and near recent events and reactions. And, but the good news was, is I recognize that as a very selfish reaction because, you know, guilt is, is, is just what a bad person I am. But, and then though, and then after that, you know, I, I, it, I reminded myself as I remind other people all the time that, one of the most accessible ways to be happy is to be is, is to be generous in whatever form, in whatever amount, you know. And it's something you can just test out at any time, right? So we, we, we don't have to expect something in return, like a thank you from somebody you give a couple of bucks to on the street. But we can't, it's okay to feel good that you did it. Right, and that's something in return, but not you know, 
it, you know, it, it's not transactional in return. Yeah. Mm. Um, uh, you, there's uh, a saying finding myself of um, that you uh, only control what you give and you have to leave it right there. Um, uh, but <laughs> there was something funny that happened tonight. I lost my keys, my car keys. And uh, I was kicking myself about it, just cursing myself in the kitchen. And my husband was there. He has a hearing problem. And he thought, he starts coming back at me. See, you're criticizing me again. He thought I was criticizing him. <laughs> so I didn't even get to uh, be able to kick myself. <laughs> and somehow I think this relates to what we're talking about, but I'm not quite sure what the connection is. Anyway, over and out. John Tyler, you'll be the last person tonight. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I appreciate what everyone has said. And I, I think one of the, one of the uh, elements of approaching compassion, this idea of, of uh, looking, taking a hard look at yourself first, and and trying to come to terms with uh, self love, I guess, um, initially, is is a, it's a really it's much more important than than for me at least it has been than um, than it's presented in the words in any book I've ever read, but you know it is a a tremendously interesting experience um, to to actually have this feeling without what so many people have said it and it's absolutely I think absolutely true without any uh, feeling that you want anything back um, that 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 it's just that is a way to live um, the only place I have a problem is that I feel like I have a hell of a lot more compassion for animals than I do for humans. And it really kind of bothers me. Um, when Michael was talking about uh, some aspect of, you know, think of somebody that you really have a problem with. Well, man, they're all around me. Uh, and I really have zero ability to have compassion at certain levels. And I don't know why that is. I don't know why I can't release myself uh, in the same way. Um, I know that, you know, I've, my experiences <clears throat> that I never ever, before I became a Buddhist, spent a lot of time listening to anybody else. And that was where I first approached compassion was to step back a little bit and to to try to hear what somebody else was saying without comment, without judgment, without any kind of uh, expectation, actually. And it's really um, when you're truly, well, I find when I truly am able to do that, I feel I feel a lot calmer than than I do in my normal, uh, in my normal behaviors, and you know, and and from that point of view, I agree with Dan. I think it's it's a it's a nice feeling. Um, it's a feeling that, for once, maybe there is a chance that you can let your ego go. Um, and I think I have a real connection between that compassion thing and and uh, struggling with thinking about myself or somehow twisting everything so that it, 
you know, it's a part, of, it's a come, it comes out of a part of me. Um, and I think this, I started out in Buddhism with the idea that I wanted to become compassionate. I wanted to understand what it was. I realized it's a hell of a lot harder than I thought it was. But, you know, every time you get a little glimmer of it, um, it reinforces, I think, that thoughtfulness that you have to take with yourself in terms of how you feel about yourself. And that it you know, sort of says, this, is, this too is possible. It sounds real simple. It isn't really. It isn't really very simple to actually execute, uh, but when you do make by accident, you execute it. It is a. It's a good feeling. Um, and I think, you know, it's one where it's nice to to have that experience without expectation, without having any expectation. I think living without expectation is probably one of the most wonderful gifts that you can have, um, especially in the world the way it goes around today. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was a great class. Thank you, guys. Well, we should end. So. Who come for a discussion group tomorrow night? Uh, yeah, discussion group tomorrow night. That's right. Okay, Trip, do you want to do the chance? Yes. We'll close by saying a prayer for peace and then dedicating the merit earned by our practice to the benefit of all sentient beings. Trip, I'm going to mute everybody, so unmute yourself. Okay. By the blessings of enlightened and compassionate ones, by the power of my positive actions of three times, and my prayers of pure aspiration, may wars, conflicts, epidemics, and all other maladies dissolve in this world. And may the earth and all who live on this earth enjoy the abundance of well-being. May all learn to live lovingly with each other. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom, may the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled, may all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thanks, Thank you all. Everybody. Thank you Thanks, all. Michael. Thank, Thank you, Trip. everybody. Great night. Thank, well, you, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Michael. All right, did a great job. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Okay.